Welcome to the Bob Balance HealthCast. This is episode 304, Can You Get Over an Addiction? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. I'm going to start this one off um, about addiction. My uh, patients have come to me for years with various addictions, addictions to cigarettes, addictions to alcohol, addictions to different types of drugs. And when I've been talking to them, every time I've talked to them, I found a familial problem where other people in the family, family history, uh, was positive for other people addicted to other types of things or even the same type of chemical. And I've also found that these patients seem to have a lack of a neurotransmitter, like a chemical in your brain that they may not have had enough of that if we could give them antidepressants or ADD drugs or some other type of medication to replace that, that they actually got better and did not need the drug that they were craving because we gave them something to take its place. Like when we've given a drug for for smoking. We didn't just say to people, or we did for years say, stop smoking, that didn't work. But when we gave them a medication, which is really Wellbutrin, that's a, a version of Wellbutrin, uh, which is an antidepressant, we replaced norepinephrine and serotonin, the two things that smoking give you, and that stopped their craving. But your area is behavioral modification. Right. And Brett and I have been arguing or discussing this. Which comes first, the chicken yes. and the egg? <laughs> which, which, what do you have to do first? What do you have to do What's most important? for stopping addiction? What, well, what we do know is that we're not doing it right. What we know is we're not doing it right. The, the most of the models, and, and there's a new, uh, there's a book out you want to make a reference to it's called The yeah, Un- Unbroken, Unbroken Brain. Brain. And we've taken a lot of uh, the concepts that we want to discuss today from an article in the Wall Street Journal based on The Unbroken Brain called Can You Get Over Addiction? And they're both written by an author named Mia uh, Zlavitz. And her contention really delves, uh, her, her book and her article delve deeply into the dichotomy of this. You know, there's a, in, in my field, we talk about the difference between habituation and addiction. You know, the, the addiction by definition is when you get uh, a physiological need for a particular uh, substance. ingredient, substance, uh, that you then are dependent upon. The habituation ad, uh, aspect is you just get emotionally or physiologically habituated to a behavior. Uh, I used to be physiologically habituated. I had a 30-mile drive home, and I managed to always swing past Dairy Queen and get a chocolate milkshake every afternoon <laughs> and on the way home. And you know, didn't have to tell anybody about it. It was a secret. Uh, but it was incredibly emotionally important to me. And, and if I something happened that I couldn't drive that way or I didn't go that way, uh, I felt a sense of loss. I felt a sense of absence. I was frustrated because I didn't get my fix today. Well, that isn't an addiction in the in the medical sense of an addiction because it wasn't something I was physiologically dependent on. I didn't have breathing problems if I didn't get one. I didn't have an anxiety attack if I didn't get one. Uh, but I was aware of it, and I felt deprived, and I was upset marginally. Uh, and it was a habit. And so then I used the things that I know about habituation to break the habit, and it wasn't an addiction. But you had withdrawal because sugar is an addiction. Sugar well, gives you there, gives okay. you surges of norepinephrine and surges of dopamine when you eat sugar. It's an addiction too, hmm. and that's I the never problem. Thought of it that so way. it's a even though you didn't think you were addicted because our society doesn't well, say sugar is an addiction. Sugar. I mean, I could get sugar in other ways. But the combination uh-huh. of, of I think it's tryptophan that makes us calm from milk products, right? And oh, sugar. 
and the calcium and I mean it okay, is let's a start over. I, I used to be addicted to milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean and I have I mean everybody if you think about it has had a dependency on something, maybe even small dependency. Well you can have an emotional dependency right. and a psychological dependency. And you can have a physiological dependency. But my contention is that right. most psychological dependencies have to do with physiologic dependencies. Like, just say, we talk about sex all the time. So say sex addicts, okay? Sex addicts get a lot of neuro neurostimulation. They have fireworks in their brain every time they have sex. So they become addicted to the fireworks. Mm -hmm. But it's something... But, but this book talks about the part of your brain that is not wired properly or is wired differently, let's say that, than right. other people's. So Which that, is what we tell people with ADD. Right. You know, the, you know, the prefrontal cortex is just not wired the same way. You are not broken. You just function differently. And that's a and real as he critical me, distinction. He knows that because he knows that I have ADHD. Because otherwise, my leg would be moving if I wasn't taking medication. And I would have restless legs at night, which is genetic. Whole family has it. And I, the 23 and me said that's my genetic issue. And I would, ha and I would not be able to follow, and I know you, you're going to say I never do anyway, follow a line of thinking. <laughs> that's what I need you for. Guilty. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's one of the things that... I have a problem with, and that means I have a shortage of norepinephrine. And so I have to take something that improves my neurologic norepinephrine. And you would say I was dependent on it because I don't have well, it. You've seen me when I can't think. And that brings us to the argument that the author makes in the book and the article. Her contention is that so much of our efforts to treat addictions of all kinds by all systems has to do with punishment and shame, has to do with... with uh, Forcing an individual to say, I am powerless before this thing. It's bigger than I am. I can't control it. Mm -hmm. uh, to make amends to, you know, 12 step programs. Mm -hmm. And there's 12 step programs for everything uh, sexaholics, drugaholics, n uh, narcoticaholics, alcoholics, whatever. And they work for some people. Well, they do help people fight. I mean, they give them some tools that are mm -hmm. useful for breaking the psychological and emotional components mm -hmm. of the addiction. They don't necessarily stop the physiological hungers. And, and so we get into the conflict in part because the blood-brain barrier issue is there. You know, we'll give you a medicine that supposedly impacts your neurotransmitters or you take a substance that impacts your neurotransmitters, but it's not as purely targeted and refined as it needs to be. And so then you, you take a substance in order to get a little bit of the neurotransmitter fix, the dopamine, the norepinephrine that you need. You're taking a whole lot more that's damaging your body in other ways. And the offset cost of that can be very horrific. If you've ever lived with an alcoholic or dealt mm -hmm. with an alcoholic who was pretty chronic and severe, you've seen those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember seeing my grandfather going through delirium tremens in the hospital. They had him tied to a bed. They had a net over the bed. He was screaming that's and, and, and cursing. Uh, because the room was flooding and he was drowning and he couldn't move and he couldn't protect himself. What a horrible, horrible thing. And we were, we were trying to talk to him and, and, and hold him and he didn't even know we were there in, in, the, in the same room. I mean, it's just... If, we had a ward... I hope you never experienced when it. I was in when I was in medical school, yeah. I worked at the state mental hospital yeah. in Fulton just because we were so poor we needed any money. <laughs> but, I mean, I got a whole different viewpoint... Yeah on what people go through for withdrawal. And so we had an entire ward of people who would check themselves in to detox from alcohol. And we would give them, to help them detox, right. medications right. that targeted those neurotransmitters that they were trying to replace with their alcohol. Right. So we gave them Ativan and some other benzodiazepines like Valium and things like that to decrease their their withdrawal, their need for this neurotransmitter. That's what you're describing mm -hmm. is somebody who who has gone off a drug but has not yet made any of their own neurotransmitters. Oh, and physiologically their bodies are screaming. It's like yeah. they're itching, they want to scratch, you have to tie their hands. So they, they think that there are bugs or spiders or rats chewing is on them. Is that usually cocaine? I, I anyway, know. there's a lot of different ways to withdraw from a drug. that, But but really what you're missing is what the, that little piece that you're – that you're, the drug was giving you, 
that was the good part that actually that actually gave you your neurotransmitters. And then you're also withdrawing from all those terrible things that that drug gave you. And your your brain is in overload. Yeah. Well, and there are a lot of articles in the press and in the media right now about people that are becoming addicted to opioids because doctors are pre- prescribing so it's not many. Because. The, the it's, argument that is made I know. is that this is happening in part because doctors prescribe so many opioids to people and the drug companies charge so much for them that they find a way to get them on the streets mm-hmm. for significantly less money. And they're limiting doctors. And I don't prescribe right. opioids, but when I did surgery, I had to prescribe different types of painkillers. Mm-hmm. And they were they are very controlled. I mean, they mm-hmm. watch doctors. They watch patients. They have, they have printouts in our state of everybody who's taking everything. So Big Brother is watching so that they can make sure that somebody's not getting too many. And then they have to go after the doctor and they have to go after the patient. But but the problem is, is that they're addicted. So why are they addicted? Why does one person take codeine? And I hate codeine. It, make, it makes me not sleep. Yeah. I mean, but most people, it makes you sleep. So I'm wired a little differently. But Well, we know that because but, of the ADD. Yeah. So I'm wired backwards. So everything's backwards. Mm-hmm. So So basically, I understand that part. So if I take Benadryl, I wake up. If I take codeine, I wake up. That's weird. But that's common for ADDers, and I understand that. So I, I work with it, right? But but to get codeine, that usually calms you down. And that kind of makes you feel chilled out and sleepy. Well, no, I'm not sure, but I'd never really want to feel sleepy. I'll just pass out cold if I because I'm so tired mm-hmm. at the end of the day. I don't need to be sleepy. Well, what is it that they don't have? Right. That they are replacing genetically, physiologically. Yeah, like I'm replacing with trying ADD to fill the hole. medicine. We're tr- we need to fill that hole before we ask somebody to stop. Well, that's one of the things that I heard time after time after time working with alcoholics is that they don't drink to feel better; they drink to stop hurting. Right. And you know, to so to fill that hole mm-hmm. of whatever's hurting in their body and their mm-hmm. life, they find that alcohol helps numb it. Uh, probably, I don't know this, but it probably produces endorphins, and that that's what makes you feel don't feel pain. That's what pain medicines trigger. So, so we are starting to know more and more of the physiology mm-hmm. of our brain, and I think in the next twenty years, this will be a whole different discussion, and it won't be it won't be like it is now, where people are going to jail, people end up being forced, not forced. They're choosing a life of crime so that they can pay for their habit. Because instead the of, society has determined that what they need for their fix is illegal right. for them to have, like marijuana. Right. Uh, there's so many medical uses for marijuana that have been identified, <laughs> but they're not allowed because the government has decided that that's a bad thing. Uh, Yet in the hands of the right people who understand what it does right. properly, it could, it, and in the right doses, it could actually help many people like with tremors and things like that if it were legal if it were legal but it would have to be legal by prescription it wouldn't be legal just you you feel like getting some well that's one of the arguments we're having culturally right now because it goes again to the issue of do we follow a punishment based regulatory uh, authoritarian system or do we allow people the freedom of choice and options the author of this book however argues that there is a, because of the way your brain is wired, there's a connection between those pleasure centers that get satisfied by the fix that you take, whatever it happens to be, and your decision-making centers. And she says you learn to become addicted by trying to find ways in your cognitive processes, get involved in saying, well, you know, if I do this, it feels better. So you know, and if I do this, it hurts. So Trial and I'll, error. I'll, trial and error. Uh, and so she, her argument seems to be that, Instead of punishing people, putting them in prison, uh, making them go through shame-based behaviors uh, to, to resist their addictions, that what we need to help them do is be able to relearn new behaviors, to unlearn and then relearn, which comes back mm-hmm. to the behavioral interventions. You're right. How do you learn to stop craving milkshakes and break the habit of a milkshake so that you're not feeling uh, depressed or deprived or ashamed or bad because you can get one uh, 
because you were entitled to one, whatever, whatever your thinking is, how do you learn to think in a more healthy way and make better decisions about your quality of life? And so that's the premise of her book is that we need to change our understanding and our approach to addictions, uh, that people can actually grow out of addictions is also an argument that she makes. And I, I read okay. that in sure. the article. I haven't seen the research that, that she cites. But her uh, comment is that if you're left alone, most of these things you will start to grow out of in their 30s, in your 30s, anyway. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, one, one of the me- – I always look for a mechanism. How mm-hmm. does that work? Yeah. And so she, she her – has to do with the maturation of the brain. Is the brain's not mature until mid-20s. Mm-hmm. And, we would agree and with that, that. I agree with that. I mean, there are lots of studies that show that. But she states that there's – you learn new pathways – so that you can get along in society, so that your brain develops new pathways to get around this. To me, if your brain doesn't make enough dopamine, the new pathway, I don't know how that would work. How would that make more dopamine? Does it, yeah. Does it? I mean, if you're missing something, how, do, how does a new pathway make it happen? We see this in um, athletes who have a lot of head trauma. They have head trauma, and in my world, my world's hormones. In head trauma, you are you damage the hypothalamus, especially if it's frontal head trauma, the hypothalamus, and you damage the pituitary. So you don't put out enough testosterone, growth hormones, sometimes thyroid, sometimes um, uh, ACTH, which is for cortisol. In any case, you don't, all of those things trigger your neurotransmitters. So it's like you've had a trauma that damages the areas that stimulate neurotransmitters. Those go away and they, people develop needs. They develop pathways to, to, they get depressed. They, um, they're exhausted. So then their coach gives them something else. You know, Mm -hmm. they give them some amphetamines. I mean, all of this is neurologically, um, neurologic treatment of neurotransmitters, but instead of giving them the hormones, they give them what would stimulate the neurotransmitters that they're missing because of the hormones. My job is to replace the hormones so that they don't have have to have these other drugs that might in other ways damage them. That way they can self-regulate once they've got the hormones back. That's a different way of looking at this, Mm -hmm. but it's still replace what's missing. Well, and that's, you know, before we started The podcast today, we were having a conversation about receptor sites and whether or not ordinary people know anything about receptor sites. But your cells are chemically wired to receive certain stimulation. And that has a chemical component, and it's like a key in a lock. Mm -hmm. And so the receptor sites require a specific key. There's not a master key, one size fits all. There has to be a specific key for the receptor sites for the neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And the drugs that people find do have some of that, but they bring a lot of baggage with it. Right. You know, it's like a dirty key. Uh, So it it doesn't cleanly go in the receptor site and provide what the, the cells need. It does provide what the cells need, but it brings a lot of garbage with it that leads to other illnesses and other problems. Mm -hmm. And so what medicine uh, is struggling to do is to find cleaner keys. But the argument that the author of the book makes, and, and there's a summary sentence that she uses, and I'd like to read it. She says, once we learn that addiction is neither a sin nor a progressive disease, just a different brain writing, we can stop persisting in policies that don't work and start teaching recovery. Punishment, moralizing, shaming are not the way to cure a medical addiction. And so we have to look at it not as a characterological deficit. I'm too weak. I'm addicted to alcohol. I can't say no to heroin. I I can't say no no to sex. Uh, I I can't do that because I'm weak. The perception that we need to have, the understanding we need to have is this is not a characterological problem. It's a medical problem. And then if we find the right medical approach, then we can help you resolve your addiction and get the ingredients that you need in a way that doesn't put you outside the law, that doesn't require us to have to put you in jail or a mental hospital, and doesn't require us to have you uh, have you perform all kinds of shaming uh, vocabularies and, and scripts in order to set yourself off from whatever you've found that satisfies the hunger that you have. 
That's that's the key. I mean, that's the part of the book that I like that really, really help people know that there's hope that they don't have to be impaired the, their whole life. But for us to do that, there's got to be some drugs in the pipeline. And there are multiple and elements. I mean, you, you we have, have to, to have some drugs to treat this, and no one wants to treat it because it's a hands-off kind of thing. Well, it's like, I mean, literally, it's like the growth hormone argument. Right. Doctors all over America have legitimate uses for growth hormone. The government says that's a no-no, and so they're not using the pure because we thing can. they're and state using. Licensed. I understand it's illegal, and you get in trouble. And mm -hmm. even if your patient needs it, they can't have it. Because well, again, I can, it's because a, it risks my license, I even understand. if I think they need it. No, the government says they the government can't have says it, they and they say you, you can't give it to them. Mm -hmm. So they don't get it, and yet they would benefit enormously, especially with head trauma and, and, and PTSD issues coming back from mm -hmm. the war. I mean, there, there's so many conversations we need to have about this. This book, though, strikes at the core note, which has to do with the perception that we, what we need to do is punish, moralize, and shame. Uh, make something illegal, and therefore nobody will ever do it. I mean, if it's illegal, oh, my God, you can't do it because obviously we're all law-abiding citizens. That doesn't work uh, in our society. and doesn't work in any society. It doesn't solve the problem. So hopefully what you hear today is that there are discussions that have merit that are taking place saying, let's look at the whole complex of how we approach addictions and how we treat them. We need to treat them medically in an appropriate way. We need to treat them emotionally, psychologically in an appropriate way. And that means we have to come off of the concept of punishment for a characterological deficit and start looking at treatment for medical illness. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us today. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.